thank you. You've heard uh, many talks today. Um, I want to um, talk about some of the work we are trying to do at this research institute that I'm running um, called the Future of Humanity Institute. I'm not sure you can, there it is. Yep. Yep. So we are a group of about 20 researchers, mathematicians, philosophers, computer scientists, and uh, um, we're trying to think carefully about the really big picture questions for humanity, and particularly how technologies might fundamentally change the human condition in some way. Um, so we are not so interested in what the iPhone is going to look like next year or some cool new gadget. Um, this is a slide of the last uh, century, the last 110 years or so. Um, so this graph shows you, from a zoomed out point of view, how the human condition has been impacted by the First World War, um, the Great Leap Forward, the Second World War. Um, what is striking is that all these events that occupy our attention um, week from week, year from year, don't really seem to have made a fundamental difference to the long-term prospects of our species, or even at the global scale, the amount of the number of lives that are being lived, the amount of happiness or suffering. So what we are interested in are the more fundamental changes than any of these that we have seen in the last century, things that could fundamentally change the rules of the game. And you could argue that in all of human history, there have been only two uh, fundamentally important events. The first being the um, agricultural revolution. After 100,000 years of running around as hunter-gatherers, um, about 10,000, 12,000 years ago in Mesopotamia, some um, humans started to settle down and domesticate crops and animals, and have permanent settlements. That changed things because for the first time, you began to have social stratification. You had expropriable surpluses, the grains, you could have a big king or pharaoh who could tax the people and have a little center where there were sort of elites privileged and you could have some division of labor. You could have some people who specialized in building uh, plows and swords and pottery. So you have tax collection, you have written records to keep track of who's paid tax. You have wars. Um, and you have higher population densities. And this led to a faster pace of new ideas being generated and spreading. And so the economic growth starts to accelerate rapidly compared to what had been the historical norm. And then the second uh, fundamentally important event, the Industrial Revolution, really only just a few hundred years ago now, which is a blink in the eye from the biological point of view or geological or cosmological point of view. And with the Industrial Revolution, for the first time, you have economic growth becoming so rapid that it started to outpace population growth. Uh, previously, the economy had been growing, technology had been making progress, but any time we became 10% more productive and 10% richer, the population just grew by 10%, and the average income was still as low as it had been thousands of years before. We were in a Malthusian condition. Average income was subsistence level. But with the Industrial Revolution, the economy started to soar, initially just in some parts of the world, but increasingly in other parts of the world, so that large segments of humankind now have more income than they need to be able to eat enough to produce two surviving children. So this is a huge historical anomaly. Um, now, I want to talk about artificial intelligence, and I am of the view that this could be the third event that will be important enough to really register at this fundamental scale of the human condition. And you could argue that it's actually more analogous to an even earlier event, um, the rise of Homo sapiens in the first place, um, in that we're talking here about a fundamental change in the substrate that does all the inventing, all the generation of the new ideas, the production. Um, and if that were to move to a, a, a digital substrate, it would maybe be a more fundamental change than, than either the industrial or the agricultural revolution. You could argue, in fact, that this transition to the machine intelligence era will be even more profound than that. If you think about it, the um, step that took our great ape ancestors 
to Homo sapiens, this step here. Involved, well, what did it involve? It involved some scaling up of the brain by maybe a factor of three, and some changes in the neurological architecture. But we know that those changes can't be too many and not too profound because they happen relatively quickly on an evolutionary time scale. And it just takes a long time for complicated new mechanisms to evolve. So some relatively small tweaks and a small scaling up produced all the differences between, say, chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, bonobos on the one hand, and the human species on the other. Whereas the difference between the human brain and what a mature machine intelligence civilization would look like could be much, much larger. Uh, a machine intelligence doesn't have to fit inside a cranium. It could be as big as you wish, the size of a warehouse, the size of a planet. Uh, there are fundamental constraints to information processing in biological substrate. Uh, a, a human neuron it can operate no faster than 100 hertz, 200 hertz. It can fire 200 times per second. Um, Whereas the switching speed in a transistor, even current transistors, operate at the gigahertz, a billion times per second. Uh, information can propagate in, in biological tissue down the spinal cord uh, maximum at 100 meters per second. But in a computer, signals can go at the speed of light. So there are these fundamental reasons to think that the potential for information processing in machine substrate are just far beyond those uh, limits in biological tissue. So. Ultimately, I think the potential is big, but what is this AI uh, that might achieve this? So this is what AI used to be, and I think it still shapes many people's perception about computers. Uh, they are intuitively, we think of them as these kind of uh, super nerds that are really good at memorizing things and calculating things, but they lack intuition, uh, creativity, uh, common sense. Uh, so. Um, it, a lot of the work in the 50s and 60s and 70s were in the form of these expert systems. You would have human engineers and experts painstakingly handcrafting items of knowledge and putting them into a big database, a big box. Um, and then the intelligence of this box was that it could make some simple logical derivations from these axioms you put in. But basically you got out only what you had put in. And these systems were very brittle, they didn't really scale. So they had some very limited applications, but um, they didn't point the way forward um, to a more general form of intelligence. Also, uh, we, the classical AI was good at solving these kinds of problems where you can rigorously define the set of rules that need to be followed. So, so, so you might remember from when you were kids, this kind of Rubik's Cube. Um, and this is something that classical AI is really good at doing. Um, but that was about it. Um, until recently, computers couldn't see, and they couldn't hear, uh, and, and this has begun to change. Um, so we now have, and since really just maybe five years or so, systems that can um, have vision in something resembling the way that we humans can see. So you can now have um, these deep learning systems that can look at the picture and uh, attach a caption of what it sees in this picture. Um, not, not with perfect accuracy, but with reasonably good accuracy. So you might think, well, didn't Google used to do this 10 years ago? You could do the image search. Well, the way it used to be done was that Google would go through all these web pages and it would see the web pages where a particular image occurred and it would see what other text was written nearby and, and human captions and so forth. So it would guess that if there was a lot of talk about um, zebras, then probably the picture had zebras, but it wouldn't actually look at the picture to do that. But now you can just feed the raw pixel. It's a big table of numbers that represent the pixel values. And from that, make some plausible guess about what the picture shows. Um, if you run these types of network in reverse, you get something, these kind of creepy images. This um, from a few years ago, just two or three years ago, the inceptionism, where they, you kind of get these hallucinations. The same networks run in reverse can hallucinate um, pictures that they've never seen. You get all these eyes because these networks don't really know how to count. So they have a sense of local structure and texture, but they don't have a sense for structure over, over larger pictorial timescales. Um, but you could generate arbitrary numbers of these kind of weird hallucinations. It's a little bit like dreaming, but sort of si simple static images with some 
um, anomalies. Um, also, these types of um, deep neural networks, it seems, have some ability to understand intuitive visual style. So you can take one of these networks and feed it a picture and a Picasso painting and then have it generate a picture in the style of this artist. So you get something like that out, which suggests that in some sense it has understood the artistic style. This requires a kind of visual intuition. You can't write down a set of rules for how to do this, but if you feed a lot of pictures of different artistic masters, um, you can train up these neural networks to get the feel for what is characteristic about, here's another example, um, Van Gogh. Now, this is not great art, but you can see at least that it kind of hints in the direction of some of the brush stroke and um, paint characteristics that would be associated with. So more recently, you can do a similar style transfer, as this technology is called, with moving images. So you have um, here on the left a little video clip of a horse and a network that in real time can look at that and try to imagine the same sequence but with a zebra instead. Um, and that's a reasonably good job. You can detect some artifacts. If you look at the, um, the tail of the zebra, you can see it's not quite right. Uh, but, but it's pretty good. And so the impressive thing here is not that you could, using some computer graphics, make a horse look like a zebra, but that this can be done automatically without any human. It's not like a specific system built to make zebras. It's a general way to... Um, be able to translate between one set of moving imagery to another. Um, you can also run these dream sequences. So if you run these kinds of video networks in reverse, you can have um, AI that dreams up little sequences. Th these are different variations on the theme of beach. You could generate arbitrary number of these sequences. You see they're not exactly photorealistic, but they certainly are evocative and have captured some, something of, here, here's another with golf. Um, and this work, I think, is from, it's quite recent, one and a half year ago, two years ago, uh, this sort of thing became possible. And so all of these examples are variations of what you can do with deep learning neural networks. So they have neural networks like structures with many different layers, and in higher layers, you tend to get more abstract representations fed in when you train them with uh, lots and lots of examples. Um, another area where progress has been made is in creating these artificial agents that can um, learn from raw perceptual data. Um, this is the system which probably, how, how many of you have seen this kind of stuff? So maybe a 25%. Um, this is a system from a couple of years ago uh, designed by DeepMind um, that can learn to play Atari games. So what this system gets in are only raw pixel data. It's not programmed to play breakout. But it's a, a system that just tries to play and sees what scores it gets, and then plays some more. And it figures out by and by which parts of the screen, which pixels are relevant, and which kinds of behaviors tend to lead to success. And if you leave this on overnight, it becomes uh, competent in this. In fact, in, in this game, it discovers a, a, a strategy that is um, more effective than most humans. Um, and so more recently, this kind of thing, um, same principle in more complex environments. So you can now start to do this in three-dimensional uh, maze-like environments where you can have a little uh, artificial agent run around, explore, uh, get rewards when it discovers certain items and avoids others. And um, it kind of begins to resemble a little bit what you think of as, as a mouse or something like that. It can kind of navigate these unseen environments. So this technology that is behind this, well, it uses deep learning as well, but it combines it with reinforcement learning. Um, so reinforcement learning is a way to train an agent um, end to end. You give it some kind of input, allows it to interact with an environment, and it gets rewards when it succeeds at doing better. And by trial and error, it gradually can become somewhat competent. Um, all of these examples are in the visual domain. You also have um, the same network being able to produce um, 
well, interpret audio as in speech recognition. And, and, and you have found that now, now when you, you can speak to your phone and it's reasonably good at guessing what you're saying. And uh, you can also have it generate music. Let's see if this works. Another example. It, it's not great. I mean, it's not. I, I wouldn't want to buy the record, but um, it, it is kind of locally good. So if you only listen to a, a two or three second clip, it would sound pretty good. But again, it it lacks the larger scale structure that gives meaning to. Um, a human sim, it doesn't understand emotions and meaning, it doesn't have sort of compositions that stretch over minutes, but on a smaller uh, scale, it, it is pretty good. So, um, so these are things that now work pretty well in many domains, and work is now being done to try to uh, extend these basic capabilities. These are almost like building blocks, these deep learning networks and reinforcement learning algorithms. And um, can, they be, can we build things with these building blocks? Can we, in particular, we figure out ways to maybe use some of the strengths of traditional old-fashioned AI and, and, and integrate it with these neural architectures? So uh, this is an example of where you try to give um, some of these networks access to an, an external memory, augment them with some memory space where, where you can then train them with reinforcement learning to be able to read and write um, information, which with the hope that you can then have systems that are able to learn quickly, so instead of having to train them with 100,000 examples, they could learn more like we humans can do, which is we can learn from a single example, or maybe two examples, we kind of generalize, we get it. So, um, so there's work done on that, also on trying to figure out ways to more effectively represent structure, um, to get the uh, compositionality that is important for, for reasoning and language. These are all frontier areas where, where there's work being done. And um, the field has really taken off. So these big technical conferences have been growing at, at the rate of maybe 40 or 50 percent a year. Attendance is skyrocketing. There's a ton of papers coming out. And there's really the sense of the field sort of living in, in, in dog years, like every year seems to be seven years worth of uh, progress. Uh, this a sense of excitement. Um, now, there have been previous periods of excitement in AI. Uh, the field sometimes had to have started in 1956. That was a conference. The term was introduced. So if we take that as a starting year, the pioneers were really, really optimistic. They thought some of them thought you know, maybe it would 10, 10, 10 years or something would really have it cracked. And, and then their great expectations weren't fulfilled. The field fell into disrepute for a period of time. It was one of those words you didn't want to have attached to your, your company, like whatever you were saying you didn't want to say that you were doing AI because that was this kind of hyped up thing that couldn't deliver. So there was an AI winter. Uh, and then there was a the second wave of excitement in the uh, 80s and 90s, which again was followed as by a second AI winter. And now we're kind of in the third spring. So it's anybody's guess whether this, this will be like the wave that carries all the way through or, or whether there will begin setback. Now my, my belief is that there won't be another AI winter because the technologies we already have are already at the level where they are practically very useful and commercially relevant in many sectors. Logistics, inventory management, search engines, speech recognition, self-driving cars kind of being on the horizon. So once you have the technology being good enough that it's widely deployed, from that point onwards, there are strong incentives to improve it further. If you can make a 1% improvement in the uh, Google search algorithm, you made a discovery that's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. So I think that will be continued big investment from now on until AI succeeds. Um, should mention as well, another factor that has been driving this progress is advances in hardware. Um, and the deep learning revolution uh, really started when people figured out how to use graphics processing units. These are the, the video chips. Um, in your computer to run these big neural networks. That gave you a factor of maybe 100 uh, speed up relative to running them on a CPU. 
and more recently people are designing these uh, ASIC specialized chips that are designed specifically to run uh, machine learning algorithms and that gets you another maybe factor of 10 or so. So um, there are a number of um, things that the current state of technology is still not very good at doing, big technical challenges that will need to be overcome to move towards the full general form of um, intelligence that, that gives us humans our uh, dominant and unique position on this planet. So we need much more effective learning algorithms to do one-shot learning, better transfer learning. This is something that some of these networks can do to some extent, but you need much more powerful transfer learning. This is when you learn uh, in one domain and then because you have learned to master one domain, maybe playing one Atari game, you can learn another Atari game faster. That's transfer learning. So you need better, you need better reasoning. Um, um, at some point, that might enable you to really do natural language understanding and, and some other things as well. Um, we, we did a, a, a survey uh, together with some other people recently, and one of the questions we asked um, was regarding, um, well, we defined it as follows, high-level or human-level machine intelligence uh, as the kind of machine intelligence that would enable unaided machines to accomplish every task better and more cheaply than human workers. Um, setting aside jobs where we just define uh, performance as uh, such way that the human has an advantage. So if, 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 if like being an athlete has to be done by a human or a politician or a priest, like set aside those, but in terms of functional attributes. And we assume that human civilization doesn't collapse as a result of nuclear war or anything like that. So, so here is the result of that. Um, we asked, by which year do you think there is X percent probability that this kind of high-level machine intelligence has been attained? And as you can see here, well, these thin lines, these are random samples from different respondents. And you can see that individual respondents are all over the map. There are people who think, who are really confident that we will have this human level AI within 15, 15 years or something. And then there are others who think that we almost certainly won't have, have that human level AI even within 100 years. So there just isn't any consensus opinion. Uh, and different AI researchers, different technical experts have widely differing opinions on the time scale here. Nevertheless, if, if we sort of plot the median opinion in this big data set, you, you get this red line here. Um, so you can see, for example, that um, if you're asking by which year do you think there's a 25% probability that we will have attained this kind of really full human level AI, um, you get that answer of roughly 20 years. 25% probability in 20 years. 50% probability you have to go out uh, you have to go out maybe 45 years. Um, I, I wouldn't put too much weight on this. Uh, a, the track record of experts in predicting long-term technological developments is just not that great. B, there is all this difference of opinion. C, depending on how you ask the question, you get quite different answers, even if you seem to ask, ask the same question but in different wording. Um, I think that really the only conclusion we can draw from this is that it's it's not the case that the only people who take seriously the idea that we will have machines as smart as or smarter than human beings within the lifetime of a lot of people in this room, it's not the case that only people who don't know anything about the technology holds that view. Uh, in fact, if anything, it seems to be the median opinion uh, among the leading technical experts. Uh, so, so now we might ask if and when human level general AI is developed, then what are the likely outcomes? Um, I think that we can start to think about this by, by reminding ourselves kind of anecdotally about this story of AlphaGo. Uh, uh, let, let me ask again, how, how many uh, sort of know about AlphaGo or follow that some degree of, so maybe, maybe most, well, half? Um, so, so this was the system, again, built by um, Google DeepMind, um, and they decided to allocate some engineers to trying to um, perform, uh, create an agent that could do well on this, this traditional 
Asian board game Go, which is sort of in Asia what chess is in the West, except it's even bigger. It has a longer tradition, more professional players. It's just a, an even bigger deal. And it's been hard for computers to do this. Chess was kind of mastered in, in when was it, the 90s or something with Deep Blue. Um, and Go is harder because you really need uh, visual intuition to be able to perform well at this. And so in October 2015, uh, one version of AlphaGo had um, played a practice game against a European uh, Go player. And um, Lisa Dahl, who was the human champion that AlphaGo was going to go up against, um, had observed this initial practice match, and he says that based on the level I've seen in this match against the European player, I think I will win the game against AlphaGo by near a landslide. This is in October 2015. Um, then in February 2016, um, Lee Sedol says, I have heard that Google's uh, AlphaGo is surprisingly strong and getting stronger, but I'm confident that I can win at least this time. Then. In March, uh, the game starts, so it's best of five, so you have to win three. So March 9th, after the first game, I was very surprised because I didn't think I would lose. March 10th, I'm quite speechless. I'm in shock. I can admit that the third game is not going to be easy. Um, it's starting to dawn that uh, um, this alpha goes is quite a formidable opponent. Then after the third match, he lost the, the challenge, says, I felt kind of powerless. Um, it's interesting here to, to look at the timeline. So we have in 2015, in October, a system that is good at Go, but nowhere near uh, the top of the human uh, competence ladder, easily defeated. And I think that Lisa Dahl was right, that if he had gone up against the October 2015 system, he would have won by a landslide. Six months later, you have a system that is superhuman. So what this suggests is that the answer to this question, what happens if we achieve human level AI, is, I think, super intelligence. And possibly it happens fairly shortly after we have human level AI. That, so you have to distinguish these two questions. There's one question, how far are we now from having human level AI? And I said there's great uncertainty about that. Uh, some number of decades, you know, who knows? It's probably going to take quite a while. It's difficult. That's one question, um, and I think we should have a wide probability distribution of that. But then there's this other different question, which is, if and when we get there, how soon will we then get to superintelligence? And I think that could happen quickly. Now, maybe it will take hours, maybe it will take weeks, maybe months or years, but I don't think decades at that point after you have human level. Um, and, and this creation of machine superintelligence, general intelligence, not just some system that is superintelligent in one particular domain, like we've had for a long time, Deep Blue is superhuman in chess, but a system that is super intelligent by having the same powerful learning uh, ability that we have. Like you can train a, a, a kid up to do any of a thousand different professions, right? The same powerful learning algorithms and planning algorithms that we have, but even more so. Uh, that kind of superintelligence, I think, will be a radical discontinuity in, 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 in the history of life. Um, so um, it can be useful when thinking about what are the issues and challenges here to distinguish carefully between these different temporal contexts. And, I, and oft, often in the media, this kind of gets rolled into one big ball of confusion. And then you have the result that the near term is overhyped and the long term is underhyped and, and really no wisdom is gained. But if we distinguish, we can say that there is a short term context. What is possible now or will likely be possible within the next five to 10 years? or 15 years. And then there is this long-term context. What happens when we get human level, near human level, general intelligence? Um, and then a kind of deep future context, like what, what lies beyond that? Um, and I, I, I just suggested that, that maybe this is schematic, of course, but we should maybe picture it roughly like this, that I think the long-term in this sense might be actually a very brief period of time. Um, the deep future then stretches out millions or billions of years. 
So if we look first at some short-term issues, uh, kind of, well, I'm not sure exactly moral challenges, but uh, things that society can and should discuss uh, relating to how AI can be used now and so there are these, and these you've probably heard, this self-driving car, like what, what happens if it's forced to choose between running over two kindergarten girls or three old ladies? Like should it go and run over the two kindergarten girls or the three old ladies? So, to, to my mind, this is perhaps the least important ethical problem that has yet been formulated. I, I mean, it's, it's just such a distraction. To, to me, self-driving cars, if, if on average, they are safer than a good human driver who is well rested and not drunk, then I think that's fine enough, good for me. Put them on the road. 1.2 million people are killed in, in road accidents every year globally. Um, hundreds and hundreds of life years worth of time is wasted every day in, in traffic. It's just, as long as the technology gets good enough, that's the challenge, like make the actual engineering good, then then we can deal with whatever ethical conundra arises. So there's a bunch of others. I'm not going to go through the algorithmic discrimination. The more we rely on algorithms to make socially important choices, say who gets parole, what's your credit rating, uh, where should the police allocate their patrols, the, the more that socially important decisions are shaped by these algorithms, the more important it becomes that we can interrogate these algorithms, see what they, what they do, how they work, whether there are any biases, whether as a society we endorse those biases or want to correct for them. Um, there's privacy issues and so forth, filter bubble, um, that with these, these better algorithms that can kind of guess what you actually would click on or want, that can serve you up on a platter, all, all your prejudices, and you can just have them kind of confirmed over and over again. Some people seem to really like that. It boggles my mind. I always try to find things I don't already believe. Like, why, why read something I already believe? But, but a lot of people find um, the uh, militarization of this technology. It's like obviously great potential to use it for military purposes. Is it possible to avoid that in some way through international agreements? Uh, um, Sea of dudes. This is like some people have raised this. So it, it, the, the field of machine learning uh, and AI and computer science in general is a sort of fairly male dominated um, demographically. So there's a question of do the people who create the technology, do their values shape how the technology is developed? And if so, could that introduce um, distortions in, 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 in how, how, how we think of the uh, applications? So I think that all of these are kind of variations of this basic question, which are really not that fundamentally different from the questions we can ask with regard to any new technology, which is how can we live well and, and, and how can we create a flourishing society given these new affordances. So when people invented cell phones initially, they were really annoying because people would bring them into theaters and they would start ringing in, in the middle of the third act. And, uh, and we kind of learn after a while maybe to have a norm, you're supposed to switch it off. And so. As with any other technology, this is the case with, with, with AI as well. Um, so what about the long term, though? I think that, so there I think that the issues are, are quite different. Um, and I wrote a book <coughs> a couple of years ago um, on this, uh, which made a, an impression on some people. Um, and. Uh, I, 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 I like to try to take the opportunity to say that I'm actually not that down on it. I, I think the potential is huge. Now, it turns out that in the book, I allocate quite a few pages. So it's really exploring the dynamics that happen if, if, if AI succeeds, you have human level. What's, what happens next? What's the transition look like to superintelligence? And I spent a lot of pages on thinking about what exactly could go wrong and trying to understand that because it seemed to me when I was writing the book that it was more important to have a, a fine-grained detailed understanding of what could go wrong where the pitfalls are so we can make sure to steer around them whereas it seemed to me we could get by with a more vague foggy understanding of all the the good things that can happen because those we can figure out as we get to them so just because there were more pages allocated to the downside doesn't necessarily mean that I think the downside is more probable it this um, but one of the, um, the problems that uh, I was talking about was this uh, control problem. So, is, is, suppose that some 
point in the future, researchers figure out how to make machines really smart, or super intelligent. Now, how could you control something that is, super, that is smarter than you are? How, how could you ensure that it actually will do what you intend for it to do? And um, this is known as the, the AI control problem or alignment problem. Um, and the problem is kind of analogous to these difficulties illustrated in a lot of myths and fable. There's King Midas who um, wishes that everything he touches be turned into gold and his, grand, his wish is granted. So he gets very rich because he can have all these gold things and then he touches his food, it turns into gold, so that's not good. Now he's going to start, he touches his daughter, she turns into, so it turns out that what seemed like a good idea, uh, actually if you think through the consequences, uh, is a catastrophe. Um, in, in this um, subfield, which is now emerging as a technical research field, this is sometimes known as um, the problem of paperclip AI. So th th this is a thought experiment. It's a kind of cartoonish uh, thought experiment, but it stands in for a wider class of failures. So the, th the idea is here, you, you make this AI with the goal of producing as many paperclips as possible. And maybe you're, you're, the plan is that this AI will operate a paperclip factory. And whilst the AI is weak and not too smart, the only way for it to generate paper clips is by running this factory. And, and the better it gets, the better it runs the factory. So it, it looks like everything is fine and dandy. But then once the AI becomes sufficiently powerful and sufficiently intelligent, new ways of achieving a greater number of paper clips come into view. So it can at some point realize, for example, that preventing us from switching it off might result in more paper clips. If it can hack into other factories and make them make paper clips, that might reduce in more paper clips. If you have a super intelligent AI, it realizes that if it can invent molecular nanotechnology and take over the world, it could transform the whole universe into paper clips. And so the same goal in the context of limited intelligence produces behavior that is exactly what we approve of, but the same constant goal you pour on more and more intelligence, at some point, predictably, backfires, and, and you get these perverse instantiations. And so I argued in the book that um, for this, I call it the orthogonality thesis, which is that there is no necessary connection between levels of intelligence and goals you might have, or how friendly or nice you are. So you could have a really, and we see this even among humans, there are really smart humans who are, are real bastards, and there are smart humans who are really nice and good and helpful, and similarly, idiots who are really nice and kind, and idiots who are really nice. Like, it's just all possible combinations, even within the human realm. The AI, the space of possible digital minds is vastly bigger, and there are more ways for them to be bizarre, and, and there I just think there, there is no necessary connection whatsoever. So that then creates this concern of misspecification, that if you don't specify the objective function exactly right, you might get an outcome um, that causes grave damage or even destroys uh, humanity. Um, so what we want are scalable control methods, um, methods for controlling AI systems that will continue to work even if the systems become super intelligent. And there is now, but that wasn't a few years ago, but now is a, a research field where, where there's a technical research agenda and PhD students in theoretical computer science trying to make incremental progress and, and we are working on this. And, this is with colleagues around the world. So, so that's further along than it used to be. Then uh, another of these long-term challenges is the AI governance problem. Like is in a world where you have this, these advanced digital minds and all the other technologies they might quickly invent, how, how, how does governance look? Like how does international coordination look? How can we avoid wars and arms races and other misuses? On, on this problem, uh, we are sort of not as advanced as on the technical research problem. Here we are maybe where discussion about the, uh, the technical alignment problem was a few years ago. People are just starting to think about this. And there are a few papers um, in the sense that more work is needed. There's been some uh, interest from governments and industry recently. Um, um, people trying to um, um, inform themselves um, of, of what the challenges are. Um, um, uh, this, this partnership on AI is an industry consortium, a kind of forum where best practices can be shared among some leading tech actors. OpenAI is a nonprofit that is trying to uh, ensure that some of these technologies are available in the public domain so people can use them. Uh, and and there, is, there is a conversation, and I think 
a genuine interest in the community of machine learning experts, among many of them, uh, to engage with these questions. They, want, they generally want to be doing all this creative work for good, and they want to be socially responsible, and, and they are increasingly joining the conversation about how, how, how that kind of involvement could look. Um, I won't say much about this deeper future. I mean, here you have issues uh, such as what if everything goes well, we solve the technical control problem, we solve the governance problem, well, what, what should we do all day long um, over the eons ahead? Um, and um, you know, uh, may maybe uh, um, if, if you're interested, we can discuss that in the Q&A, but I, I want to leave the remainder, and I think we have another 10 minutes or so for questions, so I, I, that's all I have. Thank you.